your focus today. So thank you for your time and being with us today. Uh, just as a little introduction, this event is sponsored by the Political Science Department. Thank you, Professor Hartzell. I know you're in the crowd, so I appreciate all of your help with this. And the uh, Alexander Hamilton Society as well. So thank you all for showing up to this event and supporting us. I would also like to mention that Professor Cushing Daniels, who is right there, uh, he will be moderating this discussion with the minister. And now I will leave it off to my vice president, Danny, to give you a little bit of a background about the minister before we have you introduce yourself. So thank you. Uh, I'm Danny, I'm the vice president of AHS. Um, minister here is the chairman of the Homeland Union of the Lithuania Christian Democrats since 2015. From 2014 to 2016, he worked as a member of the European Parliament. And then in uh, since 2016, he was the member of Lithuania, uh, sorry, the uh, member of Parliament for Lithuania. He is an active member of the group of the European People's Party or the Christian Democrats. He has served as a diplomat to the Embassy of the Republic of Lithuania, the Kingdom of Belgium, and the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, and at the Office of the Government. Um, from 1990, sorry, in 1999 to 2003, he received his bachelor's in history from Vilnius University. And from 2003 to 2005, that's when he received his master's, or that's when he got his master's degree in 2005 in international relations and diplomacy from the same university. Please, okay. yes, please help us and join and welcome the minister. Before I give it off to Professor Christian Daniels, would you like to have a few words or explain um, maybe your path like you do for the audience? Um, well, first of all, thank you for being here. I understand that Friday nights uh, or evenings have uh, a bit more fun activities than, than seeing to. <laughs> Uh, somebody in the university, but in any case, it's it's really an honor to uh, to be here with you. Um, so I've I've been asked, you know, uh, what do we, you know, what what I do here in, in the United States. So I think it's my third trip this year. Let's say this year the second. Uh, but this time we've uh, we've decided with a team that uh, is represented here that we should travel outside Washington, uh, and um, uh, because I mean there is. Uh, how should I put it? Growing awareness as to the where uh, the political debates in in the United States where they lead to, and since <clears throat> quite a big portion of the debate affects uh, Europe and specifically smaller countries like mine in, in the eastern part of Europe, uh, we thought it would be good to engage with with people um, outside the bubble, so to say, and and, and share. Um, the issues, the worries, the anxieties that we do have, and listen also to uh, to to you. How do you see things going forward? Uh, because for us, really, the changes that the, the European continent is undergoing is well, is monumental. Is something that would be written in history books. Uh, this is at least how we how we feel, and we don't know always whether it's just us and we are living in our own. You know, little geopolitical bubble, or really the perception shared uh, across the across the Atlantic. So, um, so this brought me outside to walk, uh, but also why why here in in Pennsylvania is because we share history. Uh, since we became independent uh, a bit more than thirty years ago, we had this very strong partnership with Pennsylvania National Guard. For, for three decades now, our military has been training together, uh, learning how to use modern, modern equipment with uh, National Guards here from, from Pennsylvania. Tomorrow we will be uh, visiting the, the troops here nearby. Uh, many of them have visited Lithuania, many of them have trained with our troops, and uh, in many cases, our, our military, which is uh, a proud NATO country military, is where it is currently because of our partnership with uh, with Pennsylvania State and the National Guard from here. So, so this is why this is why we figured that it would be a good good opportunity also to strengthen the link, to explain the link, and 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 build it. So grateful to be here, and uh, hopefully I will have a chance to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. So I, I think the microphone in the room is going to pick up, so uh, I don't think we have to stand right here at the podium, but uh, 
I do want to take uh, questions from both the audience here in the room and also uh, online. So while uh, you all are asking questions and uh, one minister of when is answering questions, I'm going to be monitoring the uh, questions online. But uh, I, I think I want to start with so, uh, talking to the, some of the members of the uh, Alexander Hamilton Society beforehand. One of the things that uh, one of the questions that came up is the uh, relationship between uh, NATO countries and the uh, the support for NATO among the current members. So I wonder if you'd be willing to say something about where you see the alliance right now, what you think the threats both internal to the uh, alliance are, but then what the uh, big threats are external to NATO as well. Well, that's a great question. And uh, uh, maybe you you remember in, uh, in 2018, um, French president, uh, President Macron, uh, he gave an interview to one of the uh, European outlets and he said, um, Probably one of the more memorable, or he usually says some memorable things that was really rang across the globe where he said that he sees NATO as a brain dead alliance. And uh, it freaked many people out. It definitely freaked out us in Lithuania because, you know, we, we uh, really do depend on Article 5. And we, you know, especially those who are close to Russia and always seen Russia as a threat. We do tend to believe that you know, Article Five is something fundamental to, to our security. So calling out NATO as a brain dead uh, organization really uh, sent a shockwave and raised some very fundamental questions. Um, now looking back, you know it's it's easier to uh, you know to just leave emotion aside and kind of dig in deeper. Why he raised this this idea? Uh, because after the Cold War. Uh, the thinking was that we're definitely in the new peace era. And this, uh, you know, Fukuyama's uh, idea of uh, the end of history was so prevalent in NATO, outside NATO, everywhere, that basically we are living in peacetime that's, that cannot end. Every country is supposed to get democratic, uh, liberal, you know, liberal democracy uh, that... Um, uh, uh rejects communism and, and then builds peace help on, on, on very different i mean on, you know western western foundations uh so in this environment you can come to the question so why do we need nato right because if you think that russia is just temporarily aggressive and at the end of the day it will be friendly and and as western as any other european country you can get to the question okay so do we need alliance like that at all and you know, even though you know, Lithuanians would always have told you that yes, we do need because we've always seen Russia uh, as unreformed empire and one of the last empires in the world that has not, you know, that has not fallen. It has went through certain elements of reformation, but literally, I mean, it's it's still there with the same mindset as in 19th century. Uh, but for our Western allies, you know, the question might have been: maybe we don't need this architecture. Maybe we need something else. Because the, the, the last time, uh, the only time that Article 5 was uh, introduced, it was not because of Russia. It was not because of uh, any geopolitical threat that we perceive as the main threat, but because of terrorism. So maybe we need something different. Maybe something something else should should be in place in the form of NATO. So now we know, and, and then the debate started. It took us you know, four years to, to discuss this. And hope you know we were in the position in 2022, February 24th, where we said, look, you know, all those questions are answered. Because everything that we, we were thinking about is why is NATO needed? Why do such country, why does such country as Lithuania needs NATO or Article 5? It's because of this imperialist Russia that we believe has an ambition that goes beyond its borders. And, and we've seen that in action. We've seen that in 2008 when Georgia was attacked, in 2014 when Ukraine was attacked for the first time. And yes, you know, for us, natural but not, not so natural continuation of that fact was the attack on Ukraine for the second time in 2022. Um, so the understanding, at least in, you know, in vast, vast territory of Europe, you know, really came back that we do need NATO. And, and honestly, there's nothing to replace it. There's nothing that we can figure out what could be better, what could be in place, and so on and so forth. 
but it doesn't make us, you know, our life easier. And that is that is probably, you know, the, the biggest worry because now we what we see currently is NATO was unable, due to a number of reasons, find an answer as an organization to an attack against Ukraine. All the assistance that Ukraine received throughout the two years of war was not from NATO. It was from like-minded countries, a group of like-minded countries that were willing to support Ukraine. So if Lithuania, United States, or whoever is supporting Ukraine, we're not supporting it as a part of NATO. <laughs> because we did not find an agreement within the organization. We managed to find an, an, an agreement as an organization in 1995 when uh in in you know what was then Yugoslavia um and we assisted uh Kosovo against Serbia as NATO but not now because the agreement is is just not there so there is a question still so what is the future of NATO what is you know how do we go from 2022 when we got this understanding that we actually need NATO NATO is not brain dead we need it it's the only organization that is able to withstand the pressures from Russia. But how do we go from that? Where do we go from that? So there are a couple of questions. First of all, um, are we ready to go back to the Cold War times in our mindset? Get away from the mindset of peace, that the time of peace is over, and now we're unfortunately in times of war. We did not choose it. We wish we would be there. We every one of us would wish that we would live in peaceful times you know with peaceful future where we ourselves and our children could prosper and live safely unfortunately those times are over but are we ready to recreate the organization that that spent a couple of decades in the peacetime as a wartime organization and to give you an idea what what that would mean so in the last stages of cold war uh nato had roughly 400,000 troops on the border with uh, Warsaw Pact countries. So that's, if I'm not mistaken, 40 divisions. I mean, these amounts of people, amounts, you know, these, this size of military, standing military, equipped and ready to fight, is inconceivable right now. I mean, we're talking, you know, brigades that are moved, you know, from one country to another. That's a, you know, that's how big of a change we, we underwent. Um, European countries that used to have thousands of tanks, hundreds of, of, of airplanes, now have hundreds of, of tanks at best and tens uh, of, of airplanes. So we're really, really low on, on our equipment as to compare where, we, where we've been at the end of Cold War, not at the heights, because that was even you know there were even more tense tense periods um are we ready to really recreate the whole the whole thing really to be ready and and accept the fact that this is what what we need um because it entails a very difficult question um let's take um uh, defense spending which is you know a, a very uh, obvious question and it's usually being posed in in, in europe why our American uh, colleagues, how much are you willing to spend for your own security? And again, at the end of Cold War, a country like Germany would spend about 4% of their GDP to defense. Germany is a huge economy, right? Back then it was second economy in, in the world, or maybe third, I mean, depending on which, which decade, you know, when Japan was uh, competitive and, and they were competing. But nonetheless, I mean, 4% of countries like, like Germany spending on, 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 on defense, that's enormous money. Now countries are happy that by 2025, they will reach 2%. My country, my own country, we're, this year we're spending 2.77%. The debate is whether we can go to 3.5%. Uh, but what does it mean for a country like mine to spend 3.5%? That means that you have to explain to your people that you will take a huge chunk of money that you otherwise would spend on teacher salaries, on you know better roads, better infrastructure, uh, whatever is needed, you know, as understood and, and understood as a social contract 
uh, between the people and the government that this is what is needed for us. You're not going to spend it there. You're all going to spend it on defense. And that's a huge rearrangement, not just of the security understanding, but the way that the, the society works. And this is this is really big. And now we are undergoing this, this process. And the countries that are, you know, the, the frontline countries such as mine, which are closest to the to the war, the debate is a bit easier. It's not easy, but it's a bit easier because people just feel the war on their skin. You know, we have 70,000 Ukrainians that came in after the war started. In in you know, our capital is 600,000 people large as well. So, uh, so you can imagine 70,000 people coming in, you see them, they're there uh, every day. It's every day on the news, every day is in the media. Uh, um, that's the number one topic that's been discussed since the war started. I mean, the war, the war in Ukraine. People do understand what it means uh, and they do, do share uh, on an emotional level, but also on, on this understanding that, look, you know, what we see there in Avdivka, it could happen the same thing to, to us. It's, it's very, very close. Therefore, rearranging the social contract is a bit easier. While for the countries further from the front, further down, down west, it's, it's different. Especially take, you know, countries in, in southern part of, of Europe, uh, for them really to get this understanding that, look, the war might be getting closer while it's a thousand kilometers away and you have to rearrange your social contract, you have to change the way your society works. It's way, way more difficult, way more difficult task. So um, so if, if everything would progress rather calmly and history would give us an, you know, a lot of breathing space to prepare our societies, our communities you know, for this rearrangement, I think we would get there, you know, slowly we would get there. But unfortunately, as history, if history teaches us anything, that when crises do start, usually they pick up the pace. And then this is where things, you know, start moving way, way faster. Um, if, if we talk about the Second World War, right, in 1938, um, the thinking was that Munich Agreement was about to bring the peace for ages. Two years later, Europe was burning. A year later, in 41, US was in the fight. And it took just three years coming from the peace for ages to the whole world on fire. That is how fast, in some cases, history just picks up. And you you don't know. Because you feel as if you're still walking the same pace. But unfortunately, the events, they just stream past you and then and, and, and you have to react way way faster so um so whenever i'm asked you know are is europe ready is nato ready for anything you know that might be coming our way i said unfortunately not yet unfortunately not yet and if there's something that i'm truly worried about is that it might take an event you know that you could call a you know pearl harbor type of thing that will <clears throat> awaken us to the point where we'll have where we won't have the time to debate the whole changes, every every change that we need, but we'll just have to be different from the next day. So, um, so I hope that we won't have that, and we'll have time. But then again, in in the past, we've seen that these things do happen, especially if we're slower than the pace of history. Great, thank you. Uh, I just want to clarify two things, and you can correct me if I, my clarification is wrong. Some in the audience, so lots of political science folks here, so they probably know, but the Article 5 that you keep mentioning, right, uh, for those that don't know, that's the mutual defense yeah. clause that an attack on one member is an attack on all members, and we are treaty bound. All the member nations are treaty bound to come to the defense of, the, of one of the members of this attack. And the second part uh, that you alluded to, but didn't make explicit that the only time it's ever been invoked uh, was in response to a terrorist attack, it was 9 11. 9 11, right. So, it was on behalf, it was in defense of the United States yes. that NATO uh, uh, invoked it. So I want to take a question from the crowd. If, uh, if, if we have one, yeah, yes, sir. Um, 
So a few years ago, Lithuania strengthened its ties with Taiwan. And China was extremely upset about that, put a lot of pressure on Lithuania. But Lithuania held firm. And I'd like to know what lessons you think are in store from that experience that places like France and Germany that I think coddle China a lot still could learn from. Well, thank you so much for the question. Uh, um, I'm always not sure, you know, how universal is the, <laughs> is the, is the knowledge about our case uh, on, on, on China. So, in, you know, thank you for, for, uh, for bringing that up. So, for those who don't know, very briefly what, what happened. So, our government started working in, uh, in 2020, in December. And we had in our program, as government's program, that we are going to strengthen ties with Taiwan. Uh, we reached out to uh, uh, to to Taiwan, and we've uh, we've allowed them. We suggested to them that they might open a office, a non diplomatic office, as you know, per custom uh, in in Lithuania. Uh, they request whether they can open the office under the name that they wish it would be, and the name that they wished was Taiwanese Representative Office, um, and we've allowed them that. We figured that it does not break the, the customs, it does not break the treaties that we have with uh, the PRC. The only thing that is different is that every other European country that has an office like that is called Taipei under the capital uh, office. And we've allowed their, the way that they want to call themselves. My understanding is that it's about the identity of people. If they see themselves and they want to call themselves Taiwanese. I'm not there to um, force different name. And uh, and they opened the office, and China objected the, the 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 concept, and then they retaliated extremely heavily. Like no other country has faced what we faced from the PRC. So they um, enacted a full embargo on all trade. Between, between our two countries. No import, no export. About 90 ships that were bound to Chinese ports were stopped mid-sea because they were told by the port authorities that they will not be accepted. So we, we, we had to find uh, uh, other ports where to, you know, where, to, where to send the goods and, and everything that they had because it's, it's too expensive to bring them back. So, you know, so there were commodities like peat, if, if you know, kind of this is stuff that you would dig from the ground and, you know, we ship quite a lot of it to, to, to China. So we had to rearrange and, you know, sign new contracts with Malaysia. And they, they bought the ships out in, in mid-sea, basically, just signed the contract <laughs> you know, that we could just ship the other, other direction. Um, the pressure was enormous and obviously it became a political problem at home, you know, because the opposition, you know, you know, bash the government like, oh, you know, this is not the way. You know, we are hurting our business interests and then the then, then company business interests and then whatnot. But my strong belief is if you back down to this type of coercion, economic and trade coercion, you create precedent. You create precedent where the same instruments could be used against not just your country, but against others as well. You allow a country to create a rule book as based on power, not, not legal system, or you know, because we are we're part of the same legal system, it's called WTO, uh, World Trade Organization uh, system. Uh, so we we withstood. There was a lot of assistance uh, from US administration, from Taiwan, from the uh, European Union joined in, and you know, we, we really got a lot of help. Not financial. I mean, you know, it was it was up to us to uh, figure out how can we withstand the uh, you know imminent pressure, but political, so that we're not alone, um, and that no country would be alone in the face of, of, of this sort of coercion. Uh, things started to normalize. Uh, so now, at this point, our trade has almost almost back. We can import what we need. We can export most of the things, but many businesses just chose not to do that because of the risks that uh, associate. But now we associate to, to trading with, with with China. 
and uh, and I think we we have written a different rollover. Not not to cave in, not to give in, uh, but to stand your ground. Um, so that's that's when it when it comes to to PRC. But when it comes to Taiwan, we have amazing relationship. Really has been growing, you know, very very steadily, very strongly, and I'm truly proud of where we are. Um, our companies do collaborate. You know, we do. Uh, we got to know each other way better. You know, because Lithuania is extremely freedom loving country. You know, we have this in our DNA to stand with the countries that support, you know, that are fighting for their freedom. <laughs> if there's a fight for freedom anywhere in the, in the world, you would see Lithuanians waving the flag of that country. You know, when, when Belarus was fighting for their in, independence, you know, in 2020, um, you know, there was a stolen election. If, if, if you follow, you know, Lithuanians would go out with Belarusian flags. flags. Now it's all about Ukraine. Now every Lithuanian has a Ukrainian flag and it goes out, you know, regularly. When, uh, when it was Georgia's, you know, uh, 2008, that attack against Georgia and Lithuanians, all the Lithuanians were driving with, with Georgian flags in, in, in the, in the uh, you know, out of, out of their cars. And it's, it's a DNA. It's nothing to do with the government. It's, you know, the people just feel very strongly about this. So, so there's this natural connection between uh, Taiwan and, and, and Lithuania, which I think really, really play. And... Um, uh, well, and I hope that for, for the future, you know, other other countries will will learn from this. That uh, that giving in either to China or to Russia, it never pays off. It just brings additional, you know, payments which will be bigger in in the future. That's why we use exactly the same argument when it comes to now those who you know to who talk about to try and oh maybe negotiations would be you know needed. I mean, it's not up to me to say, but I can tell you this, that if, if Ukraine is forced to negotiate, that will be just the, the delay of, of next phase of war. Why? Because, you know, you either win this, either you withstand this with the support of your allies, or or, or Russia will win. There's there is just black and white, unfortunately. There's there is no middle ground. Great. Thank you. Uh, so you, you mentioned Georgia, uh, the country of Georgia a couple of times. And uh, again, I think many in the room would probably know, but maybe, maybe not all. Russia is still there, right? I mean, the, the, the aggression against Georgia has not been reversed, right? It's sort of a, an ongoing, low intensity uh, situation. So yeah, certainly precursor. Well, I mean, Russia has not been hiding or trying to hide its, its intentions. And, you know, since since two thousand and eight, uh, and when they first were in, when they first attacked an independent neighboring country, uh, occupied parts of the country, uh, threatened to attack the capital, and they saw some you know twenty kilometers uh, from from uh, Georgian uh, capital of of Tbilisi. And uh, the biggest problem was that you know you would have heard any Baltic representative saying exactly the same thing that I'm saying right now. We're not surprised. This is Russia that we know. This is an imperialistic country as willing, bent on attacking the same person. And we're like, nah, you're paranoid. Okay, 2014, same thing again. Any and every Baltic representative that was out there would have told you exactly the same thing. I was a member of the European Parliament. Back then, and I was speaking exactly the same words. We're that unoriginal. We we were saying, look, this is. I mean, how many times do you have to see the same thing happening all over again for you to believe that this is a reality? I mean, how many times? No, you're paranoid. This will be fine. This is the last time the Russia attacks anybody. And now we're saying the same thing. This is not about to end. Russia is not about to stop. They're mobilizing additional troops. They will do anything and everything to get back, you know, the, the, the greatness that is in their minds. And the greatness that they have in their minds is the 19th century Russia that, you know, spanned from, from Japan to whoever, wherever. I mean, who knows? Yes. Um, moon. So, uh, so this is this is what, what they're getting at. And again, unfortunately, we're, we're saying, look, you know, you, you sound a little bit paranoid there. I mean... So we're hoping that this time we'll be heard. Who knows? So uh, one of the questions from the feed, uh, talking about uh, Lithuania's uh, push for greater energy independence, right? 
So for a long time, Lithuania has uh, been dependent on uh, uh, energy supplies from Russia, from Gazprom. So can you talk a little bit about the ongoing efforts and how, like, what sort of a time frame you're looking at for perhaps achieving energy independence? Well, thank you for, for a great question. So um, when Baltic countries were integrated into, um, occupied and integrated in the Soviet economic, economic sphere, um, we were also integrated into the energy economic sphere, meaning that we were hooked on a single pipeline where we would receive our gas, a single electricity grid, uh, oil pipelines, everything. I mean, we were just part of something, you know, the Soviet monster, you know, really, really big system. And we were just, you know, part of it. So when we broke three, three uh, the problem was that we, it was, you know, it was really expensive uh, and difficult to cut off ties because you would have to build a lot of infrastructure that's incredibly expensive, especially for the country that are recovering from, you know, the, the decades of, uh, of, of being non-free. Uh, so, it, you know, it normally would take a while. And what happened was that in 2008, uh, Lithuania was dependent on single gas provider. And we're a cold country, we're a northern, you know, northern country. So we use a lot of gas for heating in order to, you know, to, to heat our homes, because we do that almost half a year, you know, at least five months, that's that's for sure. Otherwise, we would, you know, freeze it up. So, um, so what Russia started doing is they started increasing the price of gas whenever they did not like the decisions that we would make. So they don't like the government that is being elected, uh, that's formed after the election, you know, they, they hike up the price. And at some point in 2008, 2009, so, you, you know, if, if you remember, that was a time of, you know, big economic uh, difficulties all across the world. We were paying the highest price for natural gas in Europe. And the country being back then, definitely not the richest in, in, in Europe. So it's a, it's a very, very high, you know, difficult thing, you know, either coming from your own pocket or from the government, which, which needs to compensate, you know, to, to the people who are unable to, to afford, you know, heating their homes. Uh, so it was a politically manipulated energy price. So the government back then took a decision which was extremely costly and uh, and, and seemed you know very far out. Um, we started building uh, with a Korean company of Hyundai uh, an LNG, a floating LNG terminal. Basically, it's a ship that can convert uh, liquefied natural gas into the gasified form that would, you would use to heat your home. So you don't need, it's like a, a factory in the ship. Normally you would have, a, you know, you would build a factory, but this, this factory in the ship is cheaper, a bit cheaper to have it in, in the ship. And it was absolutely new technology. And we were the first country to build this in, um, in the region, definitely in Europe. I, I'm not sure maybe Spain had something, something similar. So in 2014, the ship arrived and it became operational and it's still operational and it's called Independence. You know, guess why? Um, since then, we're paying, well, market price, which is way, way lower than anything that we used to pay uh, before, before acquiring the ship. Because now the gas comes from the United States, Freeport, in uh, Louisiana, uh, Norway, uh, Northern Africa, you know, the Algiers, I don't even know. I mean, anywhere where the price is good, we purchase the ship with liquefied natural gas, comes to the port, connects to the, the ship that we had in, in the port, it gasifies, and we heat our homes, or supply the industry, or whatever. Um, since it's already 10 years that we had the ship, and we've been early adopters of the technology. We build up certain know-how. And when Russians, uh, you know, when, when Russians attacked Ukraine, and Europe decided that we will switch off uh, Russian Russian gas, and many other countries in Europe decided to switch off Russian gas, uh, uh, they started building exactly the same ships as we do have. But they do not have the know-how how to operate the ships. 
So now Lithuania is operating two ships in Germany, uh, exactly the same ships, but just we know how to operate them. And uh, it's it's uh, and it's good business, yeah. <laughs> honestly. So it's uh, so it has been uh, it has been a, a you know a great success story. Uh, so now we're completely free from Russian uh, gas, uh, Russian oil. And the only last thing that is left is uh, that we're still part of the Russian electricity grid that we are looking uh, for to, uh, I mean, we're planning to turn it off in 2025. Uh, for that, we needed two interconnectors with Poland, our southern neighbor. Uh, one is already built, second is being built, and when both are operational, we will cut off the last ties to, uh, to Russian interest in Britain, and then we're completely free. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, since you spoke of the electricity grid, I uh, must uh, comment on Professor Bazadonis, who is our uh, own Lithuanian professor who happens to be on leave, which is why he's not here to greet, uh, greet you all, but he does work on uh, electricity markets in general, but uh, he has some projects with uh, uh, faculty at the University of Vilnius on uh, the Lithuanian electricity market. Uh, other questions from the room? Uh, so just a quick question. You speak a lot about uh, NATO and how important NATO is. Uh, I would tend to agree. My question for you is, uh, to what extent do you think like NATO's greatest contribution is to the alliance uh, in terms of the warfare domain or uh, perhaps like a certain platform that you specialize in? Um, well, as a political answer, it would be uh, that the biggest uh, um, donation from, from NATO that we're, we're getting is, is the actual deterrence that nobody wants to test our NATO uh, which, you know, uh, Maybe many outside NATO do not know how it would work, but uh, it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> you know, we have a nuclear uh, alliance that has the biggest uh, declared military capacity in the world and probably in the history. And, um, and this is what you don't want to mess with. Uh, practically, what what we where we are currently, because the situation is changing, right? And you know, I, I talked before that one thing is to have a, a military alliance in peacetime, right? When you have a, a possibility of about brain dead and, and, and whatnot, and there's a bit of difference when you have a, actually a wartime, and and how do you adapt? So the biggest change that has happened since um, uh, invasion of Ukraine was that. In last year, NATO has adopted what is called regional plans. So that means that every country, every chief of defense in every country, and most of the military leadership in, in NATO know what would happen. Scenario this, scenario that, and you know, so many of the things. And this is what we didn't have. So that means that we are getting ready to defend. The alliance is, you know, the, the, the gears are starting to, to, to move uh, towards, towards better, better defense. Mm, the biggest worry is that we don't know how much time we have. You know, because we're democratic countries, you know, it takes a while. You know, we talked about social contract. And we, need, we need money that's not easily available. We have to convince people to actually give this money to, you know, to government to, to spend and, and and so many other things. So um, so things are moving. Things are changing. The regional plans are in our own place, and we need to fill them up with uh, with the capacities, right? So that every country that is in the plan would have actually devoted the military that is needed for those plans to be actionable, and and and, uh, and equipment and ammunition and everything else that is that is needed. Technologically, NATO is by far more advanced. Than any possible foe that NATO would uh, have to stand against. So uh, I want to follow up because there were a couple of questions from the feed uh, related to this, and I don't want to bog down just on NATO issues. But given the recent expansion in NATO, uh, there's there's concern that you by expanding NATO you 
expand the risk, right? Uh, you you expand the the alliance, but you expand the risk that one will be uh, attacked. Uh, there's also concern uh, from the questioner about does expanding the uh, alliance too far hollow it out in any way? So can you speak about the, the pros and cons of expansion? Um, well, the first thing about expansion, uh, I mean, I'd like to change a bit of wording that NATO, you know, NATO's expansion is not like Russian expansion. Russia expands, right? It invades territories, it, you know, it occupies them and then it, you know, uh, just forces them to be part of Russia. NATO doesn't work like that. You know, the countries decide democratically that they would like to be in NATO. So it's like, you know, pulling the blanket on, on yourself, not somebody throwing it on you. And it's it's important. Why? Because Russians are always using the same narrative. Oh, you know, NATO is expanding on us. No, no, no. Countries that are close to you are worried that you might attack them, and that's why they want NATO. To defend them, that is that is the way the way it works. That's that's number one. The second thing is that we come to understand that European European continent uh, cannot be safe if one of the countries is not safe. Um, and, and this is, I mean, and this is what probably led to uh, um, Sweden and, and Finland joining NATO. Right? You cannot imagine that Finland being under threat. Got a bit under attack, and you know the whole NATO then just you know kind of relaxed on finance. At least it's not us. It doesn't work like that. And and therefore you know you would hear us always also saying exactly the same thing about Ukraine, right? It's it's naive to think that Ukraine being under threat even after the war has has been over um, would somehow you know, make our situation uh, in, in Europe better. It's either we are together, safe, or we are not. Um, so this is why you would see countries, you know, knocking on the door and, and, and then asking to be to be let in. Uh, third thing is um, that when, when there are new countries joining in, we have to consider what they're bringing into the alliance. Obviously, I mean, it cannot be that you know either the United States or you know the, the, the bigger allies such as UK, France, Germany, uh, just taking care of you know new and new and new countries, more and more territory and more and more borders. You know you have to really tell what you're bringing on the table, and and therefore you know when we're talking about Finland, with if I'm not mistaken, nine hundred thousand people off reserve. That means that the people out of four million people country, you know, one one fourth that's went through training, the military training. Um, well, that's that's significant. That they're they're bringing a lot, you know. With and then add to that um, aviation, you know, with the modern fleet of F thirty fives, um, naval forces, and and so many other things. You know, Finland is a formidable military power. Uh, be it not that not the largest one, but I mean they pack a bunch, and they packed it during the winter war, you know, straight into the teeth of of of, of Soviet Russia. Um, Sweden again, technologically super advanced, you know, with uh, with modern uh, airplanes that they produce themselves, Griffin, uh, with submarines that they produce themselves. So they're not just military power, but also industrial power. So it's it's clear. Now when we talk about Ukraine, and it's a most difficult discussion, right? Because so many people will say, oh, we cannot, you know, defend Ukraine right now because, you know, they're vulnerable and, and so on and so forth. It would be very difficult to defend. Ukraine currently has the biggest military force in European continent, apart from probably the only other country that you would consider, uh, if you can consider it uh, European, is Russia. About a million people went through not training, uh, not reserve, but actually military fighting. With most of the fighting has been going with NATO equipment, NATO weapons, NATO standard weapons. Um, so that's that's a lot. This is something that nobody else has, you know, apart from probably the only apart from the United, United States. So if 
if you were to look, you know, into the future and ask yourself, you know, is you know, is there something that that Ukraine is bringing to NATO? Oh yes, definitely. All the knowledge, all the know-how, all the capacity. You know, and I I would be proud that my country would stand together with with Ukraine defending allied territory and, and being under the same article five. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, how do you think that um Vladimir Putin and Russia is reacting to the fact that Finland is now NATO territory, which I think obviously makes a lot of sense for NATO, but you know that kind of makes his access to the Baltic Sea and the Gulf of like very limited. So do you think that that would mean that he would possibly escape Finland? Or I mean, I just feel like that would be the you know if you're with Russia, that would that's something you have to do. Because I just don't see any way he had access really to the Baltic and eventually in that unless you go up and around. Yeah, well. Um, of course, his his access now to the Baltic Sea is, is is way way more limited than it was in the past. Sorry, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, definitely. Um, you know, we, we we tend to think that the Baltic states are probably the most vulnerable um, when it comes to you know how because there's this thing you know that's called strategic depth. That means that you know how fast the, you know the invading country could move, move in. And take parts of the territory, and you know when you take a country like Norway, for example, which has thousands of kilometers of strategic depth, basically that they can, you know, retract and you know go back, and then uh, you know counter counter attack when they when they feel uh, ready. The thing is, three hundred kilometers, you know, it's four hours drive from water to 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 the border. Now uh, it's it's very small country. Um. At this at this stage, we believe that Putin does not want to test the military might of NATO because of the technological advance. You know, air superiority, you know, missile superiority, definitely NATO has that. But his temptation might come from perceived political weakness and lengthy democratic processes within uh, within our societies. This is what we you know with this is why it's it's worrying the debate that is happening in, in, in Congress. This is why it's worrying that all the discussions that are taking place in Brussels or in Berlin or you know, maybe you know, not, not at this point in my country, but you know, who knows? I mean, you know, it's democracy. You know, the coalition might form that would be just unable to, you know, to, to get to a position, uh, to formulate a position. And he might bet on that, that if there is you know push on NATO. And we suddenly just fall apart politically. Unable to, you know, we have the might, but we're not able to use it because we cannot execute. So this this is this is also worrying, and this is why we're also pushing for for us to have a political answer in Ukraine, because it also deters, right? We're not all only military, uh, militarily strong, we're also politically strong. Uh, so um, so yeah. We'll see. I mean, that's it's it's a it's a whole new world now, you know, and and, and we have to adapt to the lots of new new thinking as to as to what he might do um, and how we might or should react to what's happening. So there's a, a I believe like in the United States you have a, an election in 2024. Yes. Uh, exactly. And uh, so one concern that has come up around the world is. Uh, election interference from bad actors outside. Uh, can you speak to that, whether it's the Russian threat or, or other uh, either state or non-state actors and, and what the concerns are and without revealing secrets, what is being done to counter this? Um, so, yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we, we've we seen that. And uh, in, in the past, not just in Ukraine, not just in Europe, also here in, in the United States, there's a, a huge interest by bad actors to, to influence the democratic processes all over you know, because they perceive that as as also as you know some sort of a weakness that we do have you know it's easy to to talk to us when we're all excited you know and uh uh choosing the next next leadership next administration so you just you know pour in some uh misinformation or just you know flat out lies and and then you kind of you sit out and see you know what's happening so you basically don't need to be an active participant, but you can be a passive 
actor that is in influencing and, and they've seen that uh, work quite quite effectively. We had our share uh, of this, I'd say about 20 years ago. And, and you know the funny story is that when we first figured out that you know that somebody is meddling in our political processes and we you know we reached out to partners uh in most cases in many cases we were told look you're just young democracy you're learning the ropes it takes a while it takes a while you know just just do your thing you know learn democracy we we can teach you a thing and we're like yeah I mean, it's way more difficult when there's this guy in the room you know and and you know doing stuff and spreading lies and and, and, and doing whatnot i mean but we were uh basically i mean we were left alone because we were as brown uh, what we did, one of the things that we did, we, we've seen that the most, you know, there was no, not much of social media back then, right? In early ages, early years of, of Facebook, right? um, and, and that was probably it. Um, we've seen that there is an interference that's coming from businesses, from private businesses, you know, who would have ties with bad actors and they would be interested in influencing political parties and by financing bribing you know who knows what most of it was legal but the interest behind it it was it was not necessarily um good for, for for the country aligned with the country's interest so what we did is that we removed the possibility for private businesses to fund the election so it's all state funded it's extremely boring <laughs> <laughs> because there's no money <laughs> nobody has any money because the state you know uh there's a formula in every party every candidate you know now we, 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 it could be presidential election you know, parliament election and then we get the, you get the amount of money and it's very very limited and you cannot go a cent beyond that if you go and you know your opponents would see that and then you could be thrown out of the election completely so you have to be either extremely you know, creative, it's very difficult with that, you know, limited amount of money, and, but it's extremely transparent. Everybody knows what everybody else has, right? And then you, you got it from the same uh, source. It's state budget. That's it. So, uh, uh, but that's it. We basically sealed the system off from, from the actors like, like that. Um, this year, you know, we have election actually at the same time as as you will uh, in in October. Um, we might be seeing a little more interest by the countries further further to to the east, not from Russia, but mostly from from the PRC. They are interested. They are interested in the outcome of elections, uh, mainly due to the foreign policy decisions. They could, you know, they wish that some of the parties would, would form a coalition that would have a different outlook to its foreign policy and, and maybe change the name of the representative office, you know, who knows? So, so they, they are interested, definitely. Um, we're yet to see whether how much, you know, active or passive measures they will, will take. You know, it's, it's still early to, to say that, but the interest is definitely uh, from the room. Uh, the European Parliament is having their elections this year also, in, at least in the United States uh, and in Europe. There's a lot of interest in it because of the rise of conservative parties in Europe. Could you speak to that and uh, the, the rise of conservative movements throughout Western Europe? And Europe? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been, a, you know, a concern since I'd say... 2014, um, because this is what this was the first time that Europe actually faced real migratory changes. You know, a huge migratory changes, which in in turn influenced uh, more far right movements. When it was a um, uh, civil war in Syria started, and uh, that led to millions of people being displaced and, and then millions actually choosing Europe as their uh, destination, you know, for, for, uh, for you know, just any livelihood. And, uh, and you know, that, you know, I can tell you, I have many people out. 
and they were looking for something, you know, for something different. And um, since it happened so that the parties that took the decisions to allow people in, uh, especially in, in Germany, they were right-wing parties, center-right. Uh, you know, Chancellor Merkel, you know, she's from, from CDU, which is a conservative party. So basically, if you're, uh, if you vote center-right, uh, in most cases, you would be the one, you know, at a more focus about migration, and you would expect your party to, uh, you know, have to, to listen to you. And if you're not getting that response, then, you know, center-left definitely won't have that answer. So where do you go, right? You have to, you know, you move even further, further to to the right, and this gave rise, right? So we've seen the rise of AFD uh, alternative for, for for Germany and um, in Germany, and then then so many other Le Pen and her movement in in France and so many others in uh, across across Europe. So that 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 happened. Uh, some of those parties, you know, stabilized, became more traditionally accepted. Basically, you know, they expanded their electoral base, many more topics that they talk about, not just, you know, they might be anti, you know, anti-green deal or, you know, you know, a couple, couple of other things. Basically, you know, they, so now they have this uh, space card for themselves. And the thing is that currently migration is still a rather big issue, especially in, in the countries of Southern Europe and, uh, and, and parts of Western Europe. Uh, it has not gone away. Europe was unable to find uh, a clear answer as to what to do, uh, apart from making agreements with the countries that uh, some of the migration flows go through, such as Turkey or um, uh, Tunisia. So basically, we tried to make an arrangement with a country that migrants would go through and that they would be stopped there and not reaching, reaching Europe. Um, I'm not sure how sustainable is, is the strategy because it puts a lot of leverage on us, meaning that if the country is at odds with Europe, I mean, it can just, you know, open the door and suggest people moving, moving ahead. And then we have you know, political problems that we, you know, have to have difficulties to, to keep up with. So it is, um, uh, it is initially fuels, uh, you know, far right parties, you know, or, uh, more to the right because not everybody is, is you know is as far right as, as uh, you know uh, but i mean it, it could be that the ecr group which is european conservatives and reformists if i'm not mistaken is what is called the you know, more right than the christian democrats where i'm coming from uh they could have a stronger seating in in the next european parliament that could happen this is this is at least what is being what is being predicted now when it comes to migration i can just tell you you know certain things that um, just just one number, you know, there are about twelve million people in Egypt that are being displaced from everywhere else, and they're currently being held. In, you know, they are there in Egypt, and there's almost no social system as to how to care for those people. So they're just there, and Europe is just just outside. You know, just one C away. And uh, so we, I don't think that we've seen the last of it. And, uh, and it, could be, it could be very problematic in, in, in the future if we don't manage to find a, you know, a sustainable answer as how we are going to deal with, with the issue because there are hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people in, in Northern Africa, in Sahel Africa, uh, that are unhappy with their living conditions that they see in a prosperous Europe as as their as their goal. And obviously Europe with our social standards, so to say, you know, kind of what we've promised to the society, we're unfortunately are unable to uh, to offer that to everybody who who uh, who joins in. So uh, so it it is difficult. And the last point on this uh, about migration is that there are again you know bad actors who are working to instrumentalize migration. You know, in, in, in Sahel, in, in Mali, in so many other countries, Russia and Russia's partner, you know, private mercenary group, they're very active there. You know, uh, creating instabilities, you know, removing government, changing governments, organizing groups and whatever. And that also adds up to, um, to migration flows. Because people just, 
you know, they just kind of live in, in this in this environment, which is unstable, and they uh, they tend to move. And uh, for them, you know, where they would move is is easier. So again, I mean, this is very uh, very uh, closely connected to uh, to the sentiments of the voters. And um, and again, we will you know, we will see how this works out. I want to be respectful of your time. I don't. I don't know what your time frame is. Uh, one more question. Okay. Uh, so I, I won't take it. Uh, gentleman in the back. Yeah. In, as our presidential election officials you got a rematch, and I'm wondering, um, what would the victory of one candidate or the other mean for Lithuania? That's a question I'm getting every single day while I'm here. <laughs> and it's the one that I cannot answer you, sir. <laughs> well, the thing is that we are not participating in in U.S. election. Um, we're just uh, a polite observer. <laughs> and um, we're anxious. I can tell you that. But this is as far as, as, as I can go. Um, the only thing is that one of the missions that I have, you know, with, 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 with me on my, you know, on my trip here is to tell the story why the transatlantic link is vital for the security and the safety of my country, of, of Europe, and also the United States. To tell that story for whichever administration would win, that at least we've managed to get our message through. Now we we need this connection. It's imperative. We we have to you know, we have to keep it strong. It uh, it made Europe strong. It helped us get back on the map. It helped us thrive for three decades. And if it's there, I'm sure that you know we will we will thrive for for you know for decades to come. If it's if it gets weaker, if it changes, if the new reality is born. I'm worried for the world. All right. So uh, I want to thank the former minister of Lithuania. That we uh, were not respectful enough that the uh, ambassador of, of Lithuania to the United States is also here. So we appreciate your presence as well. Thank you to the students of the Alexander Hamilton Society and Political Science Department for uh, hosting this. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you.